Esta poesía se la voy a dedicar al que vive en el recuerdo. Su título es La pena negra, de Federico García Lorca. Federico García Lorca, perhaps Spain's greatest poet and dramatist of this century, was executed 50 years ago in the early days of Spanish Civil War, aged 38. There remain some fragments of black and white film, photographs, Lorca's drawings and writings, but so far, no recording of his voice has ever been found. Lorca wasn't just a poet, he, he was an excellent pianist, for example. He, he sang folk songs, he, he drew very well. He was an amazing dramatist, he, he was an actor. He directed plays and, and set up a traveling theater called the Barraca under the Republic, taking classical plays out to the villages, the lonely villages of Castile and Galicia. He seemed to be capable of everything. He, he was a magic, charismatic figure. Ian, why do you think that you, an Irish writer, became so involved in the life of a Spanish poet? Well, no, I wasn't really an Irish writer when I began to, to work on Lorca. It's working on Lorca that made me an Irish writer. Uh, I went to Lorca to, rather, rather, to write a thesis on, on Lorca. I was already interested in his work. And I went to Granada in Lucia, where he was born. And I spent the first few months of my time there going out into the Vega, an artist's fertile plain, talking to people in Lorca's village, talking to people down by the rivers in the fields, looking for the sources of the work, talking about I've forgotten hours of the execution of the place in the road. You know, I was writing the letter to the foreigners. So we came to the floor. We saw the end of the road. How do you do? No, that I am 600 meters de fora. No, I don't want to go. The foreigners have no one known from all the thousands killed in Granada, where Lorca's body had been buried. He closed my balcon because I don't want to go to the llanto. But behind the walls of the dark walls, I don't hear anything else than the llanto. There are very few angels who sing. There are very few cats 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 who sing. And one day I woke up and I knew I was going to write a book on his assassination, on what had happened, not only to him, but to thousands of other people in Granada, and shelve the thesis. The thesis I might add is still shelved somewhere there, and uh, what was going to the thesis became a book. And it was a great success, because we now know that Franco had only five years left to live. The regime was cracking, and people were avid in Spain to hear about what had happened during the war, because the book is not just about Lorca's death, but about what actually happened in Granada. And since then, it's gone on from strength to strength. I think it's been published in 14 languages, which shows you how interested people are in Lorca. Yo nunca fui a Granada, nunca vine a Granada hasta mucho más tarde, hasta 1984. Puede decir el poema de Federico, palabra del que nunca fue a Granada. Lorca's great friend and contemporary, the poet Rafael Alberti has always deeply regretted not having taken up Federico's invitation to visit him in Granada. He remained in exile until Franco's death and finally made the trip to Granada in 1984. <laughs> Nunca fui a Granada, mi cabeza cana los años perdidos. Quiero hallar los viejos borrados caminos. Nunca vi Granada, dadle un ramo verde de luz a mi mano, una rienda corta y un dedo pelargo. Nunca entré en Granada, qué gente 
enemiga pueda sus adarbes, que en los claros cielos libres de sus aires, nunca fui a Granada, que en hoy sus jardines aprisiona y pone cadenas al habla de sus surtidores, nunca vi Granada, en hilos que nunca fuisteis a Granada, hay sangre caída, sangre que me llama, nunca entré en Granada, hay sangre caída del mejor hermano. People are letting off fireworks with tremendous excitement as they celebrate the life of the greatest poet ever born in Granada. If Lorca hadn't been assassinated, he would have been 88 today. And the people of his village, of Fuente Vaqueros, have gathered to do him homage 50 years after his assassination at the hands of the fascists in Granada. It was in Fuente Vaqueros I first saw the light of day. In all the vigor of Granada, and this is not mere exaggeration, there is no other village so attractive, so prosperous, and with such capacity for fun as this one. And beyond the stage, there in the corner of the square, is the house where Lorca was born in Fuente Vaqueros on the 5th of June, 1898. He was born into a, a large and privileged family. His father was a wealthy landowner who had made a huge amount of money from sugar beet at the turn of the last century, when Spain lost Cuba and there was no longer any cheap sugar flowing into Spain. Federico spent 11 years immersed in the village life of the Vega, and this put him into contact with the ordinary people who were working on the land, the people of the fields, the farm workers, the peasants, and even with a colony of gypsies who sang deep song, Cante Honda, the ancient music of Andalusia. I see so Bebe el agua tranquila de la canción añeja, arroyo claro, fuente serena. ¿Por qué te vas tan lejos de la plazuela? Voy en busca de magos y de princesas. ¿Quién te enseñó el camino de los poetas? La fuente y el arroyo de la canción añeja. My very earliest emotional experiences are associated with the land and the work on the land. My whole childhood was centered on the village. Shepherds, fields, sky, solitude, total simplicity. It's not often that we approach life in such a natural, straightforward fashion, looking and listening. I was a curious child, and I followed our vigorous plough all over the fields. I liked seeing how the huge steel blade could open incisions in the earth and draw forth roots instead of blood. On one occasion, the plough hit something solid and stopped. The shiny steel blade was pulling up a Roman mosaic, so that the first artistic wonder I ever felt was connected with earth. The whole of Andalusia is like a, an archaeological site, composed of layer upon layer of different cultures and civilizations. Lorca knew this and was fascinated by it. And he was living only a few miles away from Granada, the last bastion of Islamic culture in Spain. The contemplative man goes to Granada to be all alone in the breeze of sweet basil, dark moss, and trilling nightingales exhaled by the old hills near that bonfire of saffron, deep gray and blotting paper pink, the walls of the Alhambra. To be alone, to ponder an atmosphere full of difficult voices, in an air so beautiful it is almost like thought. And the civilization that produced the Alhambra was destroyed by the Christians in 1492. It was a terrible moment, though they teach just the opposite in the schools. An admirable civilization was lost, with poetry, astronomy, architecture, and delicacy unequaled anywhere in the world in order to make way 
for a poor, cowardly, tight-fisted city, stirred up at present by the worst bourgeoisie in all Spain. <laughs> The sepulchres of the Catholic kings have not kept the Islamic crescent from showing at times on the chest of Granada's finest sons. The dark struggle continues without being expressed. On the Colina Roja are two dead palaces, the Alhambra and the palace of Carlos V, which continue to fight the fatal duel throbbing in the heart of every Granadan. Mas la Granada es la sangre, sangre del cielo sagrado, sangre de la tierra herida por la aguja del regato, sangre del viento que viene del rudo monte arañado. La granada es la prehistoria de la sangre que llevamos, la idea de sangre encerrada en glóbulo duro y agrio que tiene una vaga forma de corazón y de cráneo. The water of Granada slakes our thirst. It is living water that becomes part of whoever drinks it or hears it or wants to die in it. Mi corazón reposa junto a la fuente fría. Llénalo con tu giro, araña del olvido. El agua de la fuente su canción le decía Llena con tu silo, araña del olvido. Mi corazón despierto sus amores decía, araña del silencio, tejele tu misterio. El agua de la fuente lo escuchaba sombría, araña del silencio, tejele tu misterio. Mi corazón se vuelca sobre la fuente fría. Manos blancas, lejala, detened a las aguas y el agua se levantando de alegría. Manos blancas, lejana, nada queda en la agua. Es una foto que yo creo que da admirablemente la figura de Federico. Señala al mismo tiempo el poder y el valor de esa cabeza y al mismo tiempo la debilidad del cuerpo. Por eso me gusta tanto también la postura, la postura de las manos. ¿no? Esa postura de las manos que también están subrayando Nosotros hemos tenido la suerte de oírle a él leer su propio poema. Él tiene una voz caudalosa, redonda, embastecida, como un cadáver de agua. Él, él recitaba exactamente igual que hablaba. No te conoce nadie, no, pero yo te canto. Yo canto para luego tu perfil y tu gracia, la madurez insigne de tu conocimiento, tu apetencia de muerte y el gusto de su boca, la tristeza que tuvo tu valiente alegría. Tardará mucho tiempo en nacer si es que nace un andaluz tan claro, tan rico de aventura. Yo canto su elegancia con palabras que gimen y recuerdo una brisa triste por los olivos. I think that Lorca wouldn't be the Lorca we know today 
if he hadn't met Manuel de Falla, and if Falla hadn't, to a certain extent, taken him under his wing, a sort of second father. He was in his 40s, he looked like a man in his 60s, and he was Spain's most famous living composer. Falla hears Lorca playing the piano in this very house where we're sitting, and he's just amazed that any boy of his age could have such a genius. I think that Lorca was aware that Falla was a deeply frustrated man, uh, that if he hadn't expressed this in his music, he would have died. When I mean, you listen to Falla's music, you say, this is a passionate Dionysian man. But you look at the life, the external life, and Falla's trotting off to mass every morning and seems to be incredibly Catholic and worried about sin. When Falla heard that Lorca, his friend, whom he admired so much, whom he loved so much, had been arrested and was in danger, he went down to the town to talk to the civil governor and to intercede on Lorca's behalf. And they say that when he arrived there, he went in and asked. They told him that Lorca had already been shot, and that he came out weeping. He was he just destroyed. He fell to pieces. In Nights in the Gardens of Spain, which I think is probably the piece of music by Falla most well known, there are several folk songs which are re-elaborated by the composer to produce this new music. This is what Lorca does at one level in his work. I think that what Falla taught him more than anything was to look at the Andalusian tradition, to realize that he himself had this tradition in his blood. That, for me, is the, is the amazing consequence of their friendship. pure essence of Cantejondo, or deep song, was being lost. And together, they organized, in 1922, a competition for singers of flamenco. I'm going to say flamenco, although really, flamenco is the modern version of what is a very ancient tradition. The maestro Manuel de Falla, pride of Spain and soul of this festival, declares that Cantejondo is perhaps the only form of song on our continent that has preserved in all its purity, both structural and stylistic, the most important characteristics of the primitive song of Oriental peoples. We are indebted to the gypsies for building these lyrical channels through which all the pain, all the ritual gestures of the race can escape. The great artists of southern Spain gypsy or flamenco, whether they sing, dance or play, know that no real emotion is possible unless there is that form of inspiration we call duende. Duende is not in the throat. Duende surges up from the soles of the feet, which means that it is not a matter of ability, but a real living form. The true poems of deep song belong to no one. They float in the wind like golden thistledown, and each generation dresses them in a different color and passes them on to the next. Oh, 
Mira, 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 mira,